Okay, so let's get started then. So today we're going to um, carry on with some of the, the review of the, the content that we asked you to do in the last, um, in the last session. And um, I'm pleased to see that there's been some very active discussion on the Piazza uh, forum. So thank you for that. Please keep it going. Uh, you know, we're going to try as, as to, to respond as fast as we can. Uh, I think we've been responding the average responses in a few hours. So please make the most of that. Um, and where, where you can and where it's OK, please try to make it a, um, a public question so that everybody can benefit from that. OK. So today we're going to go through a few things that, that I mentioned, uh, some, basically some of the concepts and ideas that have been raised in the last, um, uh, in the session in, in, in the chapter one, about the dimensions of a flow, the variables that are involved in a different flow, and the, um, the compressibility, which is something that was, is new to this, okay. which, is, which is something we didn't discuss last time. We're also going to introduce the Reynolds number. And then we'll go through the two practice questions that I set you on, um, on Wednesday. OK, so as you will have seen, in the, um, one of the first things that's introduced into the, uh, in the introduction is the concept that there's, uh, the quantities in the flow have, have, have multiple dimensions. And as you can see, in the most complex cases in everyday life, uh, you know, we really do have uh, three dimensional flow plus time. So really four dimensions um, uh, that the flow is changing in. And here, what's happening is, um, this is a simulation, but it represents the reality. At the inlet, we have a mass flow, which is changing in time and is then becoming, um, so it becomes, it pulses at the beginning of the cycle. It becomes constant, representing the outflow of the heart and then uh, cycles back and then pulses again. And you can see this happening here. The big blue region represents the pulse. It breaks down into these kind of smaller turbulent structures and then it kind of peters out, uh, comes to a zero at the end of it, and then it re repeats. And this is, if you like, you know, the, as, as complicated as it can get really in terms of the dimensions. You've got three spatial dimensions and you've got time. Now, Inevitably, in engineering, we will always try to simplify and make further make approximations, and it's a very common approximation, and a, usually a quite a, a strong um, still still retains quite a strong amount of the detail to move the flow to three D and assume that it's steady. And this um, is represented in the diagram here. This still represents a, a flow that can move in and out of the the three dimensions um, in, into, the, into the plane and out of the plane. Um, but instead of it changing in time, we now have something which is effectively a static flow. You can see, if you consider the dynamic state of the, the flow in the aorta, which is you know, truly unsteady, you can start to see how significant an approximation this could be. But generally, we could go further and we could uh, make an even more severe approximation and assume that the flow is, is 2D. We could, we could take a slice through the section of the aorta and say, okay, um, we're not going to uh, consider the fact that it has a, has a radius and a, that it's changing and, and it's, it's kind of moving in and out of the plane. And, you know, potentially you'll still be able to reproduce and understand some of the main features of the flow. But I think as you, will, you can quite clearly see that when you go from a 3D to a 2D, you start to make significant assumptions. Um, actually, the, the, the most significant assumption in this case is that there's no difference between um, this, this geometry representing a pipe flow or something with a, a radius or something which has an infinite span into the page. So it, it really is quite different in this case. But it's, it's also kind of um, representative of some of the assumptions that we'll routinely make in engineering. So I, I, I said that I was going to make this a, a you know, review interactive um, session. Um, and we're going to use, make use of the Piazza session as usual. And the first 
one we're going to do is I'm going to get you to consider um, what is going on in this case. So I've just posted a question in the, in the Q&A. Uh, it's week one, exercise one. And there's two questions I'd like you to start to discuss. Um, we can only do this by, by text. So um, do the best you can. The first one is discussing um, steady versus unsteady. And the second one is discussing um, the dimensions, the spatial dimensions of a flow. Now in the first one, you can see, I'll just create the fact this one is a bit bigger. You can see that um, you've got a, a tank of water or a tank of a liquid, and you've got um, a hole in the bottom of the tank. And what's happening is the liquid is, is exiting through the hole, and you've got to think of what, what's going to happen to that uh, flow. Um, and whether that represents a steady or an unsteady case. And then the second example, we've got the flow around an aircraft. The aircraft's in a cruise condition. And for those of you that don't know, a cruise condition represents a, a straight and level flight where all of the forces on it are essentially balanced. So the, the thrust is, is balancing the drag and the lift is balancing the weight. So as you can imagine, the flow will be going around the shape of the aircraft while it's in cruise. So hopefully you can start to see it and what's going on. And this, we get some answers coming up. Okay. So yes, as people have started to say, the flow from the container is unsteady because the pressure is decreasing. Um, I'll deal with that one first. Yes, so the, the pressure is decreasing. I, I guess um, we'll get to what that means. But yeah, the, the, the hydrostatic pressure at the point of the exit of the tank is reducing as, as effectively the depth decreases. As your water exits from the tank, the amount of water above it is reducing. And so the pressure at the exit, the hydrostatic pressure at the exit is also reducing. And what you'll come to see as we go through this next week is in, if that's the case, then the speed will also be decreasing. And in fact, this will be a dynamic uh, situation right until the point where the flow stops coming out of the hole. And so just to answer the second question, what defines a flow as steady or unsteady? So it's, it, it's defined by if you leave this to evolve, will the state change? And in this case, there's no way that flow can come out of the hole in the tank and the level can remain in the same place, right? That's just not possible. The mass it wouldn't be conserved in that case. So in this case, this is a truly unsteady flow. So how about the cruise? Aircraft is in cruise is steady. The cruise mode is the one that's steady. Right, that's right, yeah. I guess you've most, most of you have got that. All the forces on the aircraft are balanced. And essentially um, what that means is as long as there's no movement or movement relative to the aircraft, then the flow around the aircraft will remain the same. And you'll, you'll have a steady flow field. Okay, so let's move on to the second question. We'll go back to this one again, it's a bit bigger. We've got a glider, and I took care to, to choose one where the, the wing uh, is straight. Essentially, it's a rectangular wing. And if you consider the different cross sections, um, you've got A right near to the, the root of the wing, B in the mid span, and C near to the tip. In which one of these cases can we consider the flow to be 2D? A, B, or C? We'll see what we've got coming up from here. The flow can be considered uh, 2D in, in B. Some people are saying A and B. Um, so B, I'd say two, B is 2D, as A is affected by the fuselage and C is affected by the tip. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Well done. So when we do um, aerodynamics approximations on an aircraft, this, this really matters because when you start to think about the geometry around the, the area that, where you're making the test, it can have a big difference. It, it can make a big difference to the flow. And in the case A, your wing um, profile, even if you just, um, even if you took a slice through the plane at this point and you wouldn't have, um, you wouldn't see the presence of the fuselage, it's going to be impacting 
on um, the flow uh, around the airfoil at that point. You'd have you'd expect to have a you know some kind of a flow separation here and less flow going over the wing at A. And similarly at C, you're going to have flow which is escaping above and below the wing um, at the tips, and that's going to reduce uh, the flow and it's probably going to induce a motion towards the tips. You'll have you'll study more about that. Those of you that are doing aerodynamics and aerospace later. But suffice to say that really only B can be considered the 2D approximation. And even then, that's an approximation, right? Because, you know, if there's an undercarriage or if there's any kind of um, inhomogeneity or change in the geometry along the wing surface, then that's going to have an effect on the 2D assumption. Okay, good. Well, uh, well done, all of you that uh, engaged in that, and thanks. Um, I think you all got the main thrust of that. We're going, this is something that we'll kind of be continually um, questioning as we go through engineering. What assumptions are appropriate and which aren't? So we can go even further and you can say, um, in some cases, a flow can become 1D. You only need one spatial dimension to describe it. And the, and the classic example of this is the flow through a, um, through a pipe, whether it's uh, two, uh, two walls um, parallel to each other, or whether it's a, a pipe flow. Uh, what generally happens is as the flow enters either of those two scenarios, the velocity is constant. And then, as we discussed last week, because of the presence of this uh, on Wednesday, because of the presence of um, viscosity, the flow has to come to a stop at the wall due to the no slip condition. And this, we didn't discuss it, but this is something you will talk about later on in the course. The no slip condition gives rise to a boundary layer. And the boundary there is essentially the region over which the flow moves from zero at the wall to the value that it has away from the wall, the constant value in this case. And you can see here that the boundary layers are, are growing and eventually they meet in the middle because they're growing um, at the same rate on the top and the bottom surface. And what you have is at that point, you can say that the flow is fully developed. It's not gonna change any further as it moves down. And at that point, it's essentially become steady. It's also essentially become uh, 2D. Um, so, you, sorry, it's also essentially become a 1D flow. Uh, from this point onwards, you can describe the flow purely as a function of, of, of the radius or of the height of, of, that, um, of, that, of that internal dimension. Here, you can see that it's changing with streamwise distance x, but at this point, it changes no more. And actually, we can generalize and we can say for a 1D pipe flow, which has a radius of big R and a small, uh, so a, a radial coordinate from the center increasing to the uh, outer radius, we can say that the velocity profile, which has a parabolic form, which reaches a maximum of U max, can be described by this function. And the only variable that it has is R. R and U. So U is proportional only to R. This is a 1D flow. And in fact, sometimes we'll go further and we'll say that a, one, a flow will be 1D even when possibly it really, really shouldn't be. But for the purposes of, a, of, a, of reducing a complex engineering application to something that is tractable, simple to, to analyze, this is a reasonable thing to do. So in this case, um, you have a flow through a pipe and the pipe expands. And you can see that the velocity profile changes from um, its, uh, its, its, its velocity profile at the corner here and at the outlet. Um, but quite often in engineering, and we're certainly going to be doing this later on in the course, we make the approximation that actually the flow is a constant velocity across the whole of the of the internal dimension and yes there is a change the the, the velocity is um is reducing from from this point to this point and that is as we will um come to come to understand in the next few weeks is due to the conservation of mass effectively as the cross-sectional area increases between this point and that point in order to compensate the flow velocity has to decrease but you can see that we've effectively assumed there's no variation at the wall. 
And this is going to be the form, the foundation for the Bernoulli equations that we're going to be introduced to in, in part two. So what's, there's an associated assumption here, and this is, and I, I guess, rather than ask you to, to, to note this, um, this is really, um, this is really what, I, that what I'm leading to here is that this is going to be covered in your Bernoulli equations. And effectively, um, in this case, you have to make the assumption that the flow is, is inviscid. So you recall this slide from the last lecture on Wednesday. We said that as the flow meets a solid wall, it's via the action of viscosity um, is slowed down and is brought to a complete stop at the wall. The velocity of the fluid at the wall is zero. And as such, uh, there is a, a frictional force from the wall on the fluid and an equal and opposite frictional force from the fluid on the wall. And you go from having a, a constant velocity to a boundary layer. But if you take away viscosity, as we did in that last 1D assumption, you can start to, oh, I just lost a slide, I think go to it. If you, you, you start to um, see what is the impact of the inviscid flow assumption. And here you can say now that there is no, no slip condition, the, what, the velocity of the flow at the wall is the same as the velocity of the flow um, away from the wall. Um, and that as far as the flow pro profile is concerned, it, it hasn't changed in the presence of the wall. And this is um, known as an inviscid flow. And as we said in the last uh, time we met, the, um, the characteristic of an inviscid flow is that there are no losses. There's no friction. So there's no viscous losses. And, and hence it becomes known as an ideal fluid. You know, that's a, that's a myth. There's no such thing. But for the purpose of the, uh, this kind of theoretical analysis, it's, it's useful. Fluid velocity doesn't reduce at the wall. Um, uh, but it does, um, and but it but it but it can be it can be directed by the wall, and this is something that we can come back to later on. So I'll go back to the slide that I introduced that I skipped, and this is something that we we brushed on last time, and you're going to go into much more detail later on, but I thought it was worth to introduce it to you now. So the Reynolds number um, is a measure of the relative effect of of, of, of viscosity on a flow. It's in fact, it's a dimensional ratio. It's a dimensionless ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. What that means is that um, when you have a, a very high Reynolds number, then your inertial forces dominate. When you have a very low Reynolds number, your viscous forces dominate. And you can, all you need to, 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 to approximate a Reynolds number is, is a velocity, uh, a length, in this, in this example, it's the pipe diameter, and then fluid density and the fluid viscosity. And with that information, you can, you can, you can calculate what the, the Reynolds number is for that particular flow. And that number is universal, no matter what the application. If that number is above a, a certain amount, it's considered to be a high Reynolds number flow, and it's very likely that it will become a turbulent flow. 